Let's open our Bibles to the 17th chapter of Revelation. I suppose that doesn't surprise anyone. We are nearing the conclusion and we'll finish this year in December. Our journey through the revelation of how it all ends. The war between Iraq and Iran is I suppose significant in that the nations of the world are really shaken over loss of much of her oil and that'll make the importance of oil of those who are the have-nots and the haves far more important and only hasten the day that all nations of the world come toward Israel to fight over the Persian Gulf. I don't know how it's going to fit but Anytime Iran is involved in conflict, or Iraq rather, keep looking for Israel to end up with all of Iraq to the Euphrates River, which is the middle of Iraq. And uh, the Bible makes it clear that when Christ returns at the end of the tribulation, the boundaries of Israel will include half of Iraq all the way to the Euphrates River. Also you know that when the kings of the east come they will cross likely at Aramidi on the river, the Euphrates River, as mentioned twice in Revelation. And I have said that the reason they would be stopped there 13 months and uh, a day and an hour is likely that the bridges and the dams around this waterway that feeds Baghdad, the capital of Iraq, will be knocked out by earthquakes. But I heard this week that they were bombing within five or six miles of there, and that they've been dropping bombs around uh, Baghdad. And so it could be that before the earthquakes, it will have been knocked out by, by bombs. If that's the case, that would only hasten the day because the earthquakes don't heat up until the tribulation. But anyway, isn't it interesting that it's not in Germany or Brazil, but right there in God's prophetic Middle East that it's all heating up. And it will from here on. And the Christians are going to be removed. And uh, I don't care what anybody tells you, we shall suffer. We've always had our problems and persecutions, and there'll be some, in that sense, some believers here and there will have some persecution. But as far as going through the persecution of the great tribulation, absolutely not. And so the church is removed, the true church, and that's in heaven. Back down here on earth, religion prospers because it gets along very well without truth. In fact, religion prospers on an absence of truth. I'm not talking about Christianity. I'm talking about religion, which is worthless and is of probably one of the greatest curses ever perpetrated on this world. And today we begin a two Sunday morning study of how this end time apostate religion flourishes and is organized and is the final worldwide church of apostasy. Now let's turn to chapter 17 of Revelation without any further introduction and just begin by reading quickly the first seven verses that we shall study today. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come here, and I will show unto thee the judgment of the great harlot that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitation of the earth, the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns, and the woman was arrayed in, pearl in, in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great wonder or amazement. Scratch admiration. 
And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel, or what are you wondering about? I will tell thee, I will reveal to thee the mystery of the woman, and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and the ten horns. And that's as far as we'll go today. You remember in an earlier vision that the woman that, that, that introduces a child is Israel, which gave birth to the gospel and the church, consequently, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the woman in the Revelation is the picture of the true mother of truth. Now we have a false woman called a harlot, rather than married to the bride in error, is married to the world. And so obviously you have a prostitution of the truth and a system of religion that is historically marked by its union with the world. One of the five great tenets of what Baptists believe is the separation of church and state. We believe in no union of church and government, church and politics, church and the state. We believe in the union of the church with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let me pause right here and make sure that we're somatically on the same wavelength and that we understand some important terms. The word church appears in the Bible about 90 to 100 times and it is used two ways. One time, and this is about 90% of the time, it refers to a local New Testament assembly. Like, here's a Presbyterian church, or here's Second Baptist Church, or here's Trinity Assembly of God Church, or Beautiful Redeemer Lutheran, or something else. A local church. Then the Bible, about 10% of the time, refers to the word church as the whole body of believers in Christ all over the world. Those who belong to Jesus, the saved, the born again, in union with him by his spirit are called many things. We're called the, his sheep, the sheep of his shepherd. We're called his body. We're called his bride. We're called the branches and he the vine and we are called the church. Now that worldwide true church, the bride of Christ, regardless of any denomination, across all denomination lines, refers to real born-again saved people joined by Christ, the Christ by the Holy Spirit. In the worst apostate, most worldly, pagan, secular church in the city of Houston, or in Dallas, or in Rome, or Berlin, or anywhere else, there are some saved, born-again people who belong to the true church. And in the most conservative, evangelistic church in the world, kind of like this one, there are some who aren't in the true church, not really saved. And so we need to keep in our terminology an understanding that we have added a kind of third usage of the word church. And that is something which designates a system of religious thought. Whether it be how the Baptists look at things or how the Catholics look at things or somebody else. And so in that sense we refer to, quote, the Methodist Church or, quote, the Lutheran Church. But let's keep in mind that there is only one true church. And that is the body of Christ that all who are really saved belong to. And I hope that you have been born by the Spirit of God into the true church. And this local church is only an expression of your faith in Christ with your brothers and sisters in the Lord. Now the Bible designates many kinds of descriptive terms for different ages of the church, his true body, in the world's history. We have seen in the introduction to the Revelation in chapters 2 and 3, seven periods of church history. The sixth one is the one that we're just now closing out of, the Philadelphia Church Age. From 1910 to about 1940 or 50 is the greatest period of church growth and evangelism and missions and Philadelphia Church Age open gospel the world has ever known. 
But overlapping the dawning rays of that are the sunrise rays of the last age of history, the age of apostasy, the Laodicean church age, which has turned from the truth so badly it makes God sick at his mouth. Now when the Antichrist takes over the world in the tribulation, he who just d dies to be worshipped, who would be God, as his own false prophet, his own false gospel, his own false church, his own counterfeit holy trinity, is controlling the world through two ways. Chapter 18 is his false political system. Chapter 17 is his false religious system. Because man is incurably religious. The Antichrist has a system of religion which will become more powerful for a time than his own political system, world system of politics. And so this chapter 17 introduces this concept. Now, you know that in Ephesians chapter, what is it, 6 I believe, or 4, the Apostle Paul talks about the church, the real body of Christ, as a mystery. Satan never had an original thought. He counterfeits everything. So here, the false church is called Mystery Babylon. Now you say, why Babylon? Because God, after he wiped out the whole thing with Noah, started it all over again with just a few. And Ham, Shem, and Japheth were his two, three children, and Nimrod was the son of Ham. And Ham brought together all of the world's systems of religion, and he and his wife gave birth, historically, to all the other religions of the world, in essence, which boiled down to one thing. You see, God had said one thing, I exist to obey me. And God's only commandment after the flood was to go over the world and populate it. And man built a tower of Babel into heaven, characteristic of his religion, which said, I'll do my thing. We will not scatter. We'll all stay here. And the purpose of the building of the tower of Babel was not to climb up to heaven and worship God, but to climb into heaven to prove that there was no God and man didn't have to do what he said. And so Babylon, from Genesis to Revelation, is the picture of the inculcation of all man's pagan heathen religion at its birth. And is doing his own thing in independence from God. Now this last, and it came so much to focus in the Roman Empire, and so many things end as they all begin in the revival of the Roman Empire, will come out of that empire and out of those ten nations in their cities, will once again at the end of time be a worldwide new Babylon, mystery Babylon, which he says is the mother of all unfaithful religion to the true God and is characterized, mark my words, I'll show you this, by two things. One, by apostasy. Turning from the truth. You see, real religion not only thrives on not having, gets by with not having the truth, it thrives on it. Religion, I wouldn't give you two hoots. I hate religion. I love Jesus, but I don't like religion. So many things have been done, so many people damned in the name of religion throughout the history of the world. You can't see the forest for the trees. You can't get to Jesus Christ most places because of religion. And this, when the Jesus is removed and the truth is removed, when the Holy Spirit is caught out, when the church is caught out, the apostate church will really thrive, the Laodicean church, one, on apostasy and absence of truth, and two, on unity. And there has been no time in the history of the world that there has been the cry in Protestantism, in Romanism, in all religions for unity. Let's get together. Cross out doctrine. It doesn't matter what we believe as long as we all are together. 
all trying to go the same place. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and if you come any other way, you're a thief and a robber. Now, the only true union, the only true union that can be is twofold. One around doctrinal truth and two around the union of the Holy Spirit that really makes us one in the body of Christ. Now the Laodicean apostate church that you can see the foundations of almost any day you read the paper or turn on your television set is characterized by the exact opposite. An absence of doctrinal truth and the union of everything but the Holy Spirit. Liberalism has rejected the word of God as final. Therefore, all absolutes are, abs, absolutes are removed and anything goes. You go to a world council of churches, they ought to call it the worldly council of churches, and you get up and you try to get a vote on doctrinal integrity at any point of the law and you won't get it. You try to get a unanimous vote on the infallibility of the Word of God, you can't get it. Try to get unanimity on the virgin birth, the deity of Jesus, blood atonement, bodily resurrection, the Great Commission, what is the gospel and the coming of Jesus, and you can't get it in a million years. Ecumenicism is a hodgepodge of doctrinelessness that is built around everything but the unity of the purity of the gospel and the Holy Spirit. I want to point out to you that there are some very interesting movements across denominational lines today to attempt to unify. Some of them good, some of them not so good. One very interesting one is the charismatic movement. Whether you are Catholic, Baptist, Assembly of God, or whatever you are, you hear repeatedly that it doesn't matter what you believe about anything, that that ties us together is a common experience. There's that strain in the body. There's the strain of philosophical existentialism, which is first order philosophy, which simply says the fact that I believe and that you believe is all we need to tie us together. And the 66 books of this Bible are absolutely important. Faith is everything. God is not a person to be experienced. He is the ground of our being. Jesus Christ is not the center of history. He is not someone who stands at the door of your heart. It is just the fact that there is something beyond and that we can either believe in that something or we can believe in nothing, we can have faith in something, we can have faith in nothing, or we can have faith in faith. But the fact that we all believe ties us together. That's first order philosophical existentialism, and in the name of higher criticism and pseudo-intellectualism and apostasy and liberalism, that's where so much of the phony religious world is today. They don't believe anything, but at least they have that in common, that they all don't believe. Well, that ties them together. There's something else, another movement in the world. And that's an ecumenicism which is built around social action. The great majority of non-evangelical churches today do not believe the word, never preach the blood, do not send missionaries or give out the gospel, but that that ties them together is changing the social conditions of men. Community involvement, housing, welfare, civil rights, minority rights, out of the pulpit and the gospel of blood into the streets with the picket signs of free housing, and that sucks them together. And I'll tell you, many a bird of speckled feather flies together, friend, under that umbrella. Now, these are just overtures in society some right, some left, some good, some bad, some in the middle, 
which indicate that things are right today for such a movement. The head of all ecclesiastical Romanism came to our country and absolutely unquestionably the main message of this particular era of ecclesiasticism is unity. That all faiths, regardless of side issues, you know, is Jesus the Son of God really a salvation? Really by grace did he really shed his blood? Side issues be put aside and that union embracing all religion be the order of the day. Now if you look at verse number four and have ever been through Romanism, verse number six, have studied the history of the martyrdom of the Christian faith thereby. And ninth, a city built on seven hills, you begin to be pointed toward a certain system of religion. Let me point out very clearly to you I believe that while a particular order of religious thought or historic system may be the catalyst that brings it together, that the final apostate church, the great harlot, that has turned from her union with her Lord Jesus Christ to the political systems of the world and is controlled by Antichrist, is far more reaching than any one political system. Again, I'm not pointing out or saying who or what by allusion or inference or by direct statement. I am saying that while certain people and forces and systems may be the catalyst to give birth to the system, it will become so worldwide, so powerful, so fast in the tribulation that it transcends all borders as Satan appeals in controlling man, can you believe a man in the space of hours will begin to be the darling of the world in three and a half years will be acclaimed as the Messiah, will change the whole world system of political and religious thought, claim himself to be God, trigger off worldwide catastrophe, invasion and massacre, bring back the king Armageddon and be judged and sent to hell in the space of months. So we're understanding that there are systems and concepts and ideas and flows and movements and winds in the current that are making it just right for all of these things to set up because when they start to happen, folks, right after the church is removed, they're going to happen very, very quickly. And so it's greater than any one system or one church or one denomination. It is a spirit that infiltrates from Babylon originally herself down to the very end the heart of man without true, the truth, and true faith in the true God. All right, verse 1, there came one of the angels which had seven veils, vials, and talked to me, saying, come here, I want to show you the judgment of the great harlot that sits upon many waters. And verse number 15, the waters which thou sawest where the harlot sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. Now in symbolic visionary language, as he is wont to do rather irregularly, John has been good enough, the angel has been good enough to reveal to John to record for us what the vision that he meant saw was. And so he says, the waters where this great harlot sits, this revival of mystery Babylon, the counterfeit church of all rebellion against God and all false pagan religious systems of the world sits on the waters and the waters represent all the peoples of the world. Don't you see? It controls the world's people. It is universal. It covers the whole earth. Verse number two. Which who, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. And so the, the, the kings of the earth represent the political system. And she, rather than being one with the Lord Jesus, has given that over to be one with the political system of the world. 
And we need to remember down through history how religion has run to date in its church and state union and its obvious revival at the end of time. And he said, And this union has made the people of the earth drunk with the wine of her fornication. What does drunkenness do? What does drink do? It makes primarily a person oblivious to reality. You don't think like you really ought to think. You don't feel like things really are. You don't see things how they really are. Blind to truth, but blind together in union is characteristic of that revival of a system that will be the catalyst of the final world church of apostasy. Verse number three. Let, let me just say right here, you know, Karl Marx said religion is the opiate of the people. And boy, evangelicals have screamed and hollered about that for a hundred years. Scratch the evangelicals and, and say amen to Marx. He's right. Religion is the opiate of the people. Nothing damns and, and blinds and dupes to truth like religion. Jesus is the very essence of reality. When Christ is in your life, you think clear-headed, you see how things are, you got the courage and the power and the will and the direction of the Word to do anything. It is not Christ that is an opiate. It is Christ that is an eye-opener, an enlightener of truth. Religion is the opiate of the people. Well, let us keep a marked distinction. You see, Jesus Christ is not, is not just a revelation of religion. Jesus is life, its very self. Big difference. All right, now in verse number one and two, he has said, the angel has said, come here and I, go back in the middle of verse one, I will show you. He's giving a preview of what he's going to show him. Now in verse number three, he takes him away and actually shows him what he told him he was going to show him. I like the preacher I heard one time. He, I said, how do you preach? He said, well, I have three points in every sermon. First, to tell him what I'm going to tell him. Second, to tell him. And third, to tell him what I told him. So he carried me away in the wilderness and said, I'm going to show you what I've been telling you. I'm going to show you. And he sees a woman sitting on a scarlet colored beast full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Now this, we can move through this. This is recurrent material. Who has seven heads and ten horns? The beast. Who blasphemes God every time he's opening his mouth? The beast. And who did we see coming, scar spreading famine and blood on the earth? In Revelation chapter 4, riding on that third horse, the Antichrist, the beast. And so this is obviously the beast, the Antichrist. Now, very interesting, you will notice that he showed me in the vision in verse 3, the woman sitting on the beast, not the beast sitting on the woman. I think that's important. I think that is significant in that it says the religious system will completely at some juncture in the tribulation be so powerful it will control the political system. Now maybe that's why the devil ultimately destroys the religious system. And he does, because it gets so popular that it is more powerful and popular than he. It sits on the beast, and not vice versa. Verse 4, the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious and stone and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. I'll just say that I have visited, I guess outside of Russia, every major place in the world. And when you are at the places of birth, and at the places at the heart of the power structure of certain world systems, you come away sick at the billions and trillions of dollars of satin and finery and gold and diamonds and trinkets and crowns that just dazzle you. Certain religions have prospered in backward, ignorant countries for centuries. Where their leader's attitude has been, we'll interpret the word, we'll tell you what God says, we'll do the thinking. 
And how easily such people are held together by a dazzling display of light and color. So impressed. Because you see, the more candles and lights and flashing shining diamonds and crowns, because you see, you have to have that show if you don't got the truth. Because the less true light, true light you have, the more light of some kind you have together have to hold your people together. Say something about this church. I believe with all my heart. With her love for Christ and his word, we would and could if we had to sit out in the mud under a leaky old tent. We thank God for these buildings, but they're really nothing. We're here because of Jesus and our commitment and our union in the spirit of Christ and his word. Verse 5, and upon her head was a name written. Now it is not uncommon, was not in John's day, has not been to some degree through history, nor was it as late as early America uncommon for harlots, professional harlots to be registered, numbered, and have their names on their heads. Now this great unfaithful harlot to the world system is called Mystery Babylon the Great. She's named herself that. The Great, the Great One. And she is the mother of all spiritual, pagan, idolatrous, apostate, spiritual harlotry and abomination. The Laodicean church abomination from truth to nothing that makes God sick of his stomach. The mother of the whole thing in the whole world. And it all goes back to Mother Babylon. Now why is that true? Well, let me see if I can trace just a little bit of it for you. Nimrod was the son of Ham, the son, grandson of, of Noah. History, secular, and religious history interwined to give us the fabric of the truth of how it all happened. After the destruction of the Tower of Babel, where man's ultimate disobedience to God, who said replenish the earth, was incarnate in one act that said we'll stay here and do our own thing, and build it a heaven, a, a building up to heaven to prove that there wasn't a God there to do them what, tell them what they had to do, was destroyed. History records that Nimrod had a wife named Samarius. Samarius was the woman who was responsible for more, for first of all, for polygamy, responsible for for spiritual uh, polygamy and polytheism and many gods, and gave birth to the mystery religions of Babylon. Now history records that after the power of Babel was destroyed, that Nimrod was killed, and Samarius moved to Rome taking all the idols, all the artifacts, all the accoutrements, and all of the paraphernalia of idol worship of the mystery Babylon religions and settled in Pergamos. After a tremendous battle, they began to move on eastward, westward, until finally they settled in Rome. When Paul came to Rome, when Paul came to Greece, when Paul came to Europe, he was overwhelmed that the world was polytheistic. He stands within the agora between the Acropolis and Mars Hill, dumbfounded and staggered. You've got gods to this, you've got gods to that. Thesmus, Thadmus, Cecrops, Hercules, Diana, Vista. Every man's got his own god. Everybody's doing his own thing. He said, You're, uh, you who ignorantly worship, let me tell you about the one true God. And so Europe had become as it will give birth at the end of the revised Roman Empire in the tribulation to the, the home base of the world spread of pagan religions, of mystery Babylon religions. The title that the priests of Babylon wore that was in their 
the leader, the, the turban on top of their head, was Pontifax, Pontifax Maximus. For a time, all Roman emperors wore the name Pontifus Maximus on their head. Then, with church and state combined, as the harlot committed fornication with the kings of the earth, and religion became the state, and the political system became the religious system, the heads of both government and religion were one, and the ruling order always wore and does to date the name Pontifex, Pontifex Maximus. Now let's back up a little bit. There began to be, you remember that in 312, you remember your church history, we've been through this months back, a year back in chapters 3 and 2 and 3, or early church history. You remember in the secular age of church history when the church married the world, the Pergamos church age. That Constantine saw a cross in the sky, and he said he heard a voice say, In this name, conquer. And rather than persecuting the true Christians, he began to try to, quote, overnight Christianize and make Christians out of the Roman Empire, which is as pagan as hell itself. And so unable to baptize everybody, they started going through town, sprinkling water on everybody. He pronounced all the pagan temples are now Christian temples. All the pagan ceremonies are Christian ceremonies. All you pagan priests are now Christian priests. And the merging of mystery Babylon into historic Christianity began. And those who fought for separatism, the Wycliffs, the Savonarolas, the Augustines, the Husses, the Calvins, all of them, the Luthers, were martyred and butchered as heretics. Any child in almost any grade school has already begun to learn church history because it's so interwoven with the history of Europe and the world. Now, the main story, the main line of thought that came historically from Mystery Babylon under, by Samarius was that she had a son named Tammuz, and Tammuz was born not of union, but Tammuz was born by a sunbeam that fertilized her womb and impregnated her. She introduced Tammuz to the world as the savior of the world. The myth was perpetrated that he, was, he grew to be a man, was gored to death by a wild boar, and was dead for 40 days while all of the people of the system of mystery Babylon religion wept and fasted and mourned. You say, how bad did it get? Well, your own Bible tells you that. I want everybody in this auditorium to turn back in your Bibles if you have them this morning to Ezekiel chapter 9. God had been showing to Ezekiel how awful things were. This is just before the glory departed from Israel and the judgment came. And people were worshiping inside the temple of God. The system of God's religion had so intricately been involved with the system of mystery Babylon begun by the woman Samarius and her son Tammuz. Chapter 8, verse 13, Ezekiel. God said to me, chapter 8, verse 13, Ezekiel. The Lord says to me, Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than they do. He's been showing him some. He says, you haven't seen anything yet. I'm going to show you worse. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, in the house of God, in the heart of the Judeo-Christian faith, which was toward the north. And behold, there sat women in the temple, weeping for Tammuz. So intricately had Mystery Babylon been involved with the historic Judeo-Christian faith. And through the stream of Nerv 1,400 years until a period of great reformation. It was so interwoven that those who tried to stand for truth were called heretics and butchered and martyred. And this system of 
that, that gave so much credence to and importance to a mother and her son as the founders of faith is interwoven in all the great histories of the religions and the histories of the great empires of the world. In Egypt, she was called Isis and Olerus. The words for her and her son Tammuz in Phoenicia are Asherath and Baal. Baal. <coughs> in Greece, she is called Aphrodite and Eros. And in Roman history, Venus. And he is called Cupid, the little baby with the heart and the arrow. It's interesting that she was worshipped with an intricate system of sacrifice where back in Jeremiah, you can read, she is called the mother of heaven. And a whole group of people you refuse to hear Jeremiah's message because they said it is the mother of heaven who blesses us. And she was worshipped with an elaborate system of giving of incense and breaking of wafers. Verse number six. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And I wondered with great amazement. I'm sorry. Meanwhile, back at the ranch in chapter 17 of Revelation. Didn't tell you to turn back to Revelation, did I? Revelation 17, verse 6. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints, with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Isn't it interesting how it all comes to an end like it began? God made man in a garden after new heaven, new earth. It all ends up in a garden. The Roman Empire, out of which Christianity was born politically, is recreated. Mystery Babylon, man's attempt to live without truth and live without God and live in union. Where there's no true union outside of the centrality of Jesus Christ is revived. And isn't it true that in the early foundation of the church in the Roman Empire, when the sands of Rome ran blood with, red with the blood of Christian martyrs, that those who are in false religion persecute those who live and die for truth because they're, not, they're out of control, they're not in the union with the political system, and that too is revived at the end of time in the tribulation. He says, let me show you this great harlot which has been responsible from the beginning to the end for the martyrdom of the death of the saints. In verse number 7 he says, why are you wondering about this? I'm going to reveal to you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her and which hath the seven heads and the ten horns. Next week we'll continue the material, and we've been fairly well introduced to it.